Hello and welcome to the launch of our Women Rock IT series, which kicks off today and runs through until Ju July 2023. My name is Emma Reid. I'm the Global Marketing Manager for Cisco Networking Academy, and I am your host today as we explore the surprising role data science plays in helping people and the planet. Whether you're a student starting out in your career or you're looking to transition and boost your career growth in data science, you'll hear from our speakers about the tremendous opportunities a data science career can bring to your future. Careers in data science are in high demand. Salaries are incredibly competitive and the perks are numerous, which is why data science has been called the most promising career by LinkedIn and the best job to have by Glassdoor. By being part of our live audience today does entitle you to free course enrollment into six of our online self-paced courses with Cisco Networking Academy. Our newly released Introduction to Data Science, Python Essentials, the Introduction to Cybersecurity, Introduction to the Internet of Things, Networking Basics and Linux. Details relating to course enrollment will be posted during today's event. In the interest of time, we will take questions for our guest speakers directly after the session. If you're joining us over YouTube and Facebook Live, you can post your question in the chat box or you can tweet your question to hashtag WomenRockIT. Thanks and let's get started. I'm really excited to introduce today's guest speakers, Annie Hardy, Senior Visionaire at Cisco. Anne is a strategist, futurist and an expert in human machine interaction. Also joining us today is Amber Yando, Cisco's Product Manager for Data Science. Amber is a data science expert, coach, mentor, and an instructor. But first, we're gonna hear from Annie, who joins us from her home in the US. Welcome, Annie, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Emma. I am excited to be here, excited to have been invited to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is how you may have to dig very, very deeply within you, but somewhere deep within you, maybe a data diva. Now, what does that mean? I'll tell you about it. But first, I'm going to tell you about me. I am a senior visioneer at Cisco. My name is Annie Hardy. Uh, visioneering specifically is focused on the future of human machine interaction. So how humans are going to interact, not just with machines um, or robots, but how we're going to interact with the future of interfaces and screens. And I get to look at the future of the internet. So I'm a futurist, I'm a philosopher, I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I also didn't major in technology. I majored in communication arts and Spanish and had a gender studies focus, which I, I actually got a D in pre-cal, which was a, that was a very bad day. And that followed right after I got a D in pre-cal, I actually got tutoring. Um, so when you think of Cisco, when you think about women rocking IT, I think often you think about, oh, coders or mathematicians. And the fact is that some of the women that are rocking IT didn't get degrees in IT. We didn't get STEM degrees. We, we didn't start STEM careers, but we found ourselves here because we understood going through our careers, what technology had to offer and our place within it. I deeply found within me the tech diva. And so we're going to talk about some of the uh, people um, who are addressing data science specifically and some of the opportunities within data science in different ways who found the diva within themselves that related to data. So again, we talk about women in IT. I am not only a, a woman who works for a technology company in a very technical field, I'm also a mom. I'm a mom of three kiddos who are amazing. I'm also a writer. So I write on behalf of Cisco and I've written blogs on my own behalf. I'm also a singer and a songwriter and a storyteller. So I have written poetry and written songs and you can ask uh, Joey Hardy is the name I go under on uh, Apple Music or Spotify. You can look up Life Bites Back and you'll hear my music. But the reason I think this is really important is that as we go into listening to women talk about technology, tech may not actually look like what you thought it did. We may be at a point where you look back and you say, I thought I had to major in STEM. I thought I had to be an engineer. I thought this was the future of work. But the fact is that careers and technology take so many different forms that are different than I think a lot of people understand. So I wanna talk about two specific aspects of data science that have these emerging trends. And I wanna talk about data science. And so normally we'd go and we'd sit down and we'd talk about computer science and math and statistics, but I don't wanna do that. 
because people get overwhelmed sometimes when they start thinking about topics they're not good at and they start feeling like they're not going to succeed in a field. So again, D in pre-calculus, if you would come to me and talked about technology, I would have thought coding, I wasn't good at math, I wasn't good at pre-cal, I'm not going to be good at this. But I have a really high aptitude for understanding technological things. If I'd started with thinking math and science, I probably would have thought I'm not going to be good at this. So in the same vein, I don't want to talk about data science in context of all of the different bits and pieces that make it up. What I want to talk about is I want to talk about what problems you want to solve. So when we think about data science, the beauty of data science is that data that we capture is able to really help us understand and understand and get the insights that allow us to take action on some of the biggest challenges facing our world today. So I'm going to talk to you about some of those challenges because as we use data, what happens is we're able to see patterns. So when people think about data science or technology as this very technical uh, uh, group of jobs or a very technical field, data science, what they don't understand is it's not just technical. There's an empathetic aspect of it. There's a problem solving aspect of it. That part of it is beautiful. We're able to see patterns that develop. And when we understand those patterns and the insights that come from that, what occurs is that we're able to change things. It's amazing. So what I want to start with is I want to give a couple of examples uh, of where data showed something and, and the changes that occurred from that. Walmart actually discovered that clouds and wind influence the beef people buy. It's fascinating. If clouds and wind are heavy, um, the temperature or the, the wind, the weather, is not as amenable, it's not as friendly, then what happens is people are going to buy steaks. They'll make steaks inside their home or that's kind of the comfort food that they'd like. Whereas if it's a sunny day, there aren't a lot of clouds, it's bright and shining, they're more likely to buy a hamburger. And so when Walmart found this out, what they did is they were actually able to tailor advertisements and tailor offers to people based on what the weather was. They were able to increase revenue and, and this kind of insight can reduce waste as well by marketing the right product at the right time. It can change how you're sourcing the food. It can change food waste if you're if you're using these insights properly and getting uh, weather uh, data in advance. So this is a fascinating pattern that developed that's actually able to change business outcomes. So another example is that private weather companies can measure rainfall by measuring dropped cell phone signals between cell phone towers. This kind of thing isn't easy to understand. And I'm not sure who discovered this, but I think it's tomorrow.io discovered it, but who really was curious about the signals between cell phones and how to use that to actually understand the localization of weather impact. But that's what happened. You can measure rainfall by figuring out where the droplets are getting in the way of cell phone signals. It is absolutely fascinating. And with that, rainfall has a huge impact on safety. So what happens is you can actually save lives and address climate change by preparing citizens and municipalities for severe weather. You're able to tell citizens the rainfall is really heavy where you are, not just by looking at a gauge that fills up over time, but looking at dropped cell phone signals to have a closer, faster, uh, insights that you can apply to those emerging, emergingly dangerous situations. And this is just going to get, weather it's just going to get more volatile as climate change occurs. Things like this, this data, this information that we have is just going to get more and more valuable uh, as we have not only more data points, but specifically related to weather data as it becomes, um, as climate change impacts the way that the weather impacts our lives, really. Another example we have is artificial intelligence is discovering medicines to treat rare diseases. I, I love this example. When we think about how we're using technology, specifically how we're using data to be able to understand and predict things and think about how we're able to understand different medicines that are being used to treat diseases, the impact here is huge because there are so many rare diseases 
where only a couple of people or a couple dozen people suffer from it, and it's never going to be big enough for a pharmaceutical company to, or it's unlikely to be big enough for a pharma company to want to invest significant resources in researching. And so what happens is we are able to use technology to improve lives or save lives by finding treatments for those rare diseases where there are too few cases uh, to validate pharma investment. I love this example, but here's the challenge. Something like this where you have data and we're able to use it for good. Something like this is an amazing story, but at the same time, this, exa this example from Collaborations Pharmaceuticals, the same AI was able to use data to discover a chemical weapon of mass destruction. I'm gonna pause for a minute because now what we've had is we've talked about data science, we've talked about data, we've talked about you know all of the amazing things and the patterns it can develop and what the impact is. But when we start talking about climate change or we start talking about food or food safety and security or we start talking about chemical weapons and we start talking about uh, ethics, it's important to, to really understand that data and your ability to understand what it means and what insights there are that we can derive from data has an epic and possible very mortal impact. Like data can save lives or data could take them. And so as we look at the emerging trends that are happening, we really wanna understand uh, how we can look at the emerging trends in data and the emerging careers in data so that we can equip you with information that can help you figure out is there a career for me in data science? Is this going to happen? Or is it worth learning more? So there are two areas of growing importance I want to talk about today, specifically related to not just where data science is, but where it's heading. These are emerging areas of study, emerging areas where experts are really uh, doing a lot of research. And I want to talk about them today because the data science uh, the data science that people are practicing today is different than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago, because people are recognizing there's so much more we can do with the data that we have. So today I wanna to talk a little bit about responsible AI and data storytelling. So responsible AI is how to use data science ethically with ethical outcomes. And data storytelling is effectively communicating the need for and the value of data insights. So I'm gonna start with responsible AI. So let's dig in. Responsible AI is the practice of designing, developing, and deploying AI with good intention to empower employees and businesses and fairly impact customers and society, allowing customers to engender trust and scale AI with confidence. So going back to the example of this amazing AI that found medications, but which could also be engineered to find weapons of mass destruction, ethically, the team building that at Collaborations Pharmaceuticals, they had an ethical need to make sure people understood that it was dangerous to be used. They also had a need to protect the IP, the intellectual property of the product that they had built so that it didn't get into the wrong hands. So there are people who are really looking at how to ethically, what are our ethics as far as how we are ethically using AI, but also how we need to be responsible practitioners and communicators uh, of not only building equitable AI, but also actually using the AI we have in, in ways that are ethical ways. So Kelly Trindell, she's the head of machine learning trust. She is an example of somebody who's a practitioner in responsible AI. So what she talks about is ethical AI plus machine learning trust. So responsible AI, ethical AI, these are, these are blanket terms that are kind of utilized uh, to describe the field uh, that she practices in. So uh, another example would be AI integrity, digital ethics. These are also terms where if you're looking for jobs or looking for you know, things, if you're interested in, in this career, this is what you can search for. But going back to Kelly's slide, she says, I support tech innovation that makes people's lives better. North Star is always fairness. I care about getting to solutions, solving problems, and moving forward. And what she discusses is um, she's focused on trust and ethics. She's focused on a governance framework to facilitate an ambition to develop innovative and trustworthy products 
uh, that delight customers and positively impact society. I think this is absolutely fantastic. She says, pretty cool. Yes, it's pretty cool. How amazing is it that we find people who are actually practicing helping us and helping the systems that we have, helping the data, the people building it and the people using it to do it ethically. This is an emerging field. You now have degrees that are within the context of uh, responsible or ethical AI. But here's the deal. She studied psychology. So if you didn't go and study data science, if you didn't learn R, or if you don't know how to code, there are still places in technology companies and technology practices that really benefit from that visibility, that insight across uh, the human side of technology. She's a great example. So going back, if, if this is interesting to you, going back, look into some job descriptions, look into responsible AI, ethical AI, AI integrity, digital ethics, because if you look at some of the descriptions of roles in those fields, if you look at some of the job descriptions, you can actually see what expertise you need to get to get there. And you can start uh, by simply going to do online courses. Again, you don't have to have a data science degree, uh, but if you do, that's extra. If you don't, you can still learn and, learn and increasingly learn more and more with self-paced learning about responsible AI. So the next thing I wanna talk about is data storytelling. This is another career field that's really kind of emerging and becoming more important. Uh, data storytelling is a method for conveying data-driven insights using narratives and visualizations that engage audiences and help them better understand key conclusions and trends. This is really cool. There is a gap between data scientists and the businessy people that want to use the data they have. So this gap in helping data scientists communicate the value of data and helping business owners understand how to leverage the power and harness the power of data that data scientists use and data teams, there's an amazing gap, and that right now is being filled by data storytellers. Some of the titles are data in analytics, data storytelling, data visualization, data communications, sometimes titles, but just words, keywords that you can search for. These are people who are educated and very diversely, and I wanna give an example here. Emily Williams is a business analytics consultant, really large um, insurance company. She also happens to be my sister. I'm so proud. She's my sister. And she has a fascinating story. So if we just pull back from that a minute, looking at her LinkedIn profile, she says, connecting people with solutions, fostering clarity by visualizing the past in the future. It's very esoteric and it's actually quite cool. She says, my passion is in gathering and sharing knowledge, creating sustainable, shareable, and valuable solutions that are open to the whole enterprise, thinking outside the box and thinking outside the silo innovation to make projects easy to reach for everyone. And she supports a team of data scientists and engineers by helping organize our stories as well as assisting our business partners in planning the epics and features that we're working to create. Um, she says, I support in finding solutions to tech issues that exist as well as supporting using light tableau work. It's a bunch of keywords here. She's got data science, data engineering, she's got um, business, she's got tableau. There are a lot of things that she's talking about right here. She studied business. She didn't study data. She didn't study data scientist, and she is self-trained. Emily's story is fascinating because she studied business and went into the business and worked in it, but then she found herself seeing things over and over. She found herself very frustrated with patterns that were developing and she couldn't quantify them. She said, I keep seeing this in my business over and over and over. Why does it keep happening? Why can't we change it? And so she actually took it upon herself to read books and listen to podcasts and listen to audiobooks. She took some online self-paced courses. She um, got a handle, like got a hold of some of the data that they use in her company. And she brought that in as data she could use a sheet self-taught Tableau. So she was able to get uh, teach herself Tableau using the live data uh, that, that her company was able to provide for her. And she started that and within six months, she got a new job. She was no longer just working in the, the business unit on, on the line, kind of doing what she was doing, but she had moved into the innovation team in a role that was working with data analysts and doing data storytelling. She is a self-taught person that's a data storyteller. And that's not uncommon. Um, I spoke with 
some folks at Kim Harrington at Forrester um, spoke with her just recently, and she talked about how people coming in from data storytelling aren't necessarily studying data science. They're coming from all kinds of places. They um, may be coming from marketing. They may be coming from uh, they may be coming from business. They're com coming from all over the organization, but their strength is communication. Um, and so she talked a lot about the growth in this area, but the fact is that this is a really good example of how taking online courses uh, can really encourage you and increase your ability to, to find a role either in, inside your company or in another company uh, where you're elevating your skills and evolving them for a data science career, just not as a data scientist in something a little different. And again, look at data analytics, data storytelling, data visualization, data communications, a couple new ones that I got, data journalist, that's a new one to look into. Analytics translator, that sounded cool. So check out some of those different things and uh, and see what you can find out. See what patterns you see just anecdotally about what these roles offer and where maybe your skills overlap. I think it's amazing how much you can actually get done just by finding self-paced courses, by trying something new, by investigating something on your own. You don't necessarily have to go back to school. You don't have to go get your master's these days. There's so much rich content you can engage with. And these courses are no different. They are amazing and thorough. And I highly recommend you connect um, to Cisco and really explore the options you have in front of you. Um, because unless you know, you just don't, you might be missing out on an opportunity. You might have your next career. You, there might be a data diva hidden inside you that until you do more exploration, you might not know she's there. So I highly recommend you do everything you can because what I've learned in my experience, having felt like I wasn't really adept at technology. I didn't belong in technology. I got a D in pre-cal. This was something that was beyond me. I've learned since then that it's really not. Technology needs people from all different different backgrounds, but also the way people think. People think differently, and we need that diversity in thought. And so if you're not sure data science is, is good for you, start somewhere, explore it. That may be the career you never knew you wanted. Um, and I, I can't wait to hear about all of the people who take this intro to data science class and are just delighted with it. I look forward to, to seeing all the career growth that happens because of it. I'm, I'm so happy that Cisco is able to offer this to y'all. So on that note, I'm going to hand it back to Emma. Thanks, Sandy, for sharing your career journey with us and the concept of building a compelling narrative based on data that help tell a story, influence and inform. We look forward to actually having you back in July and telling us a little bit more about data science career paths. I would like to now introduce our next speaker. Amber Yando, a data science expert, coach, mentor, instructor, and a product manager here at Cisco. Welcome, Amber, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, Emma. Uh, happy to be here. I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. So I grew up in a family of women. I have a younger sister, and my mother had a younger sister. Her mother had five younger sisters. Not a single one of them had gone to college. And until my mother, all of them had been stay at home parents or they had worked in retail or both. My mother was a strong woman. She got pregnant with me when she was 17 and had to drop out of high school due to pregnancy complications. Being a stay at home mother was never for her. She frequently used to compare herself to a man saying things like, I get along better with the boys and I'm more logical than most women I know. When I was five, she decided to go back to school and get her general education development certificate. It wasn't a diploma, but it meant something to her. It was good enough to put on a resume so she could get a job and contribute to the family in the best way that she knew how and felt comfortable. Soon, she followed in her mother's footsteps and got a job in retail. She worked all the time and was constantly switching departments. She said she wanted to learn as much as possible. Soon, she made it into management, but of course, that wasn't enough. Retail was a bit too provincial for her. Eventually, she was able to land a job working as a secretary 
for an attorney uh, in a nice area of town. That led to many opportunities for her. Within six years, she was able to work her way up to a bank paralegal, a notary public, and was studying to take the bar exam, a convenient and inclusive New York State program that allows persons to take the exam if they've been working in the industry for a given amount of time, but didn't receive a law degree. She got me a job working at the office when I was a junior in high school. Working side by side with her was so inspiring. She was always leading conversations and meetings. Her boss relied on her for everything. She always knew how to solve a problem and everyone was her friend. I learned so much from her in a short amount of time. But on June 9th, 2004, I was watching Hamlet, the Mel Gibson version in English class. I had been looking forward to it all week. My phone started vibrating and I immediately silenced it. Nothing was going to distract me from the tragic play's climax I had been waiting weeks to see. After class, I saw that I didn't recognize the phone number, but they had left a voicemail. It was a police officer telling me my mother was okay, but they were bringing her to the hospital for chest pain. I went to the principal's office, told them I needed to get my sister out of class so we could go see our mom. As soon as we arrived, a nurse put us in a waiting room alone and proceeded to close the door. She then told us that our mother had passed from a heart attack at the age of 36. I was 17 at the time, uh, a senior about to graduate high school. I had pretty big dreams to be the first woman in our family to go to college and get a law degree. I was confident that I could do it because I knew my intelligent, determined, and supportive mother would be right there by my side, picking me up each time I fell, connecting me to all the right people, and pushing me to my limits. I didn't end up going to law school. I felt quite alone and angry for, for a long time. It wasn't until 10 years later that I was finally able to deal with my grief. I looked myself in the mirror and I said, what would she think if she saw me complacent, working in hospitality, wanting more from life and doing nothing about it? I didn't have it as hard as she did. Being a teenage single mother without a job or a diploma and health complications, what was I doing? Where had the inspiration gone? Did I really lose it the day that she passed? No, no, that can't be. I was simply too scared to do it without her. Mary Kay Ash, a businesswoman and founder of Mary Kay Cosmetics, an idol of my grandmother's, said, don't limit yourself. Many people limit themselves to what they think they can do. You can only go as far as your mind lets you. What you believe, remember, you can achieve. My mother was never, ever content with mediocrity, and she never settled for less than what she believed she could achieve. And at that moment in time, I realized that I felt the exact same way. I was going to make her proud, even if it meant having to do what was difficult without her. Once I came to terms with the loss of my mother, Finding data science was actually kind of easy. Um, statistics always seemed to come naturally to me and two of my greatest strengths, both I got directly from my mother, curiosity and problem solving fit perfectly into the field. Within four years, I had gone from a data science bootcamp graduate to a data science coach, instructor, professor, faculty manager, data science program manager, and now a product manager in the data and artificial intelligence space. Transitioning into tech was definitely a, a difficult choice, but I knew I had to start somewhere. After all, my mother struggled with where to go after retail, but she took the leap and landed on her feet, and so could I. I began with free Khan Academy videos and cheap Udemy courses in my spare time. Eventually, I wanted to learn to program after reading articles that touted statistics such as by 2025, 97 million new jobs will be created due to advances in technology and automation and earn up to $70,000 as an entry-level data analyst. 
So I watched endless YouTube videos in an attempt to teach myself Python. I failed miserably after a year of getting nowhere. The available content was unstructured and ambiguous. It was nearly impossible to find a free and accessible roadmap that told me exactly what I needed to learn and in what order. But today's online learning landscape is quite different than it was even just four years ago. The field of data science is also much more defined than it was when I was a new student trying to break into the data science space. The introduction to data science course on skillsforall.com is my first product. I did my best to provide learners the opportunity to learn data science in ways that weren't privy to myself and many others years ago. For example, you don't need to figure out what order to learn topics in. There are more opportunities to practice and receive valuable feedback when you get questions wrong, and it's a primer course. Its purpose is to allow anyone interested in data to get their feet wet in the field and to learn more about it at a high level and in an intuitive and interactive way. Students are also able to adjust the entire six hour course on their mobile phones. We wanted to make sure this course was as inclusive and accessible as possible. The course also provides multiple real world examples of how data science is affecting our world socially and environmentally. Getting you to think about data um, and how it can impact every interest industry. For example, data has revolutionized sports. It's improved crop hardiness and agricultural output on a global scale. It's infiltrated the fashion and entertainment industries, helping to optimize who sees what and when and giving previously underserved communities more of what they want. And now quickly, I'd like to show you all a quick video from the data course that introduces you to the concept of data so you can get a better idea of what to expect in this course. The collection and analysis of data is making information readily available for many different purposes. We are more connected than ever. In our home, schools, work, and even the areas in which we play, advancements in technologies are generating large quantities of data. Everywhere you go and everything you do in this digital world becomes a new source of data. Data is being generated from sensors, devices, video, audio, networks, log files, transactional applications, the web, and social media. It is more commonly streaming over the networks and comes in a variety of sizes and formats. Among the uses for data in our daily lives are informing our decision making. From the product recommendations that we see on our shopping sites to performance statistics on athletes to which groceries to stock in the market, our decisions are influenced by the results of data science and AI. Identifying the improvements to processes and products through the ability to use data collected from product reviews and ratings, manufacturers can modify designs or change their processes to produce and deliver better products to their consumers. Tracking and predicting events. One of the greatest benefits we can realize from analytics is the ability to track, isolate, and even predict events. A network engineer can use a dashboard to isolate areas of slowdown and immediately react to ensure it doesn't cause problems for users. Climate analysts can accurately predict the impacts of weather on all aspects of our economies. Self-driving cars can recognize hazards and take actions to avoid accidents. Enabling greater visibility into behaviors. Organizations now have greater visibility into how their products are used the buying patterns of their customers, and the up-to-date logistical information to manage their lead times. This additional level of visibility enables managers to ensure that the right products are available for their customers in the shortest time possible. So data is only as powerful as the creative agencies of the people who work with it. Women and minority populations in general are quite underrepresented in the field. The world and the data space need you. It needs you to bring a voice to the table. It needs your unique perspective to be in the room. 
It needs you to bring creative ideas based on your lived experiences. It needs you to ask the tough questions. And most, most importantly of all, it needs your empathy and your humanistic approach to problem solving. I may not have a science degree from an accredited university, and I may not have a traditional upbringing. Many try to use those as reasons to exclude or ignore me, but my resume speaks for itself. And most importantly, I've been given an opportunity to help people just like me change their lives and become part of this space. I'm going to continue to pursue that goal despite the struggles I may face. I wish you all the best in that same struggle. We're in this together. Thank you all so much for being here with us for Women Rock IT. And back to you, Emma. Hey, thanks, Amber, for sharing your personal story with us today. Your story is really incredibly touching and certainly demonstrates that women simply aren't born. They're made by the storms that they walk through. I want to say congratulations to all you've achieved in your career today. We'll take questions now. So I wanna start with questions that we have coming over our social media feed. So our first question, um, I think that's come in, is one for you, Annie. Um, we are talking about data science and you have shared a little bit, bit about AI. What's the difference between data science and AI? Okay, so there is a Venn diagram where there's an overlap between artificial intelligence and data science. They have a lot in common. Uh, but data science is focused on deriving predictions from insights to benefit a business. And then artificial intelligence uses some of the same technologies and tools, but it's specifically focused on automating things by helping machines or computer programs or robots or whatever you want to want to call them, any kind of entity that you want to be able to learn from data and make decisions based on data. It helps machines to perform cognitive functions. So it helps machines to make decisions. Uh, and so there's a little bit of a difference. Some of the tools are the same, but the outcome is different. AI is focused on machines and, and data science is focused on impacting the business. But both of them have a lot of similarities and even data science needs to be used ethically and responsibly. Um, and artificial intelligence needs to be communicated effectively. So data storytelling and responsible and ethical AI kind of can bridge the gap between all of that. Um, but, but those are the differences. It's, it's quite nuanced. Um, but we, I think of both of those as data careers. Thanks, Annie. That was really interesting. And for those of you who would like to actually learn a little bit more, we've got a part two with Annie on AI and machine learning uh, during our upcoming broadcast that's going to be held in July. So be sure to check out the details on our Women Rock IT website on how to register for that event. Don't miss it. So here's another question, and this one is for you, Amber. Um, what skills do you think I should prioritize learning if I want to get into data science? Awesome. Um, so what skills should you prioritize if you want to get into the data science space? Yeah. Um, great question. Get this all the time. Um, something I obviously struggled with um, early on. Um, so courses do a pretty good job at helping you prioritize that so you don't really have to think about it. Um, but many people uh, start to get into this space through kind of like a self learning strategy. They don't really want to invest too much money right away um, or even time right away until they're a little bit more sure that this is really what they want to do. So if you are a person that is like, I already know, I've done all of the research, I know that I want to get into this space, where do I get started? Um, it's really going to depend on your background. So I'm just going to kind of say like the top three skills that you really need to have a good understanding of. Um, and then depending on if you already know those, um, those things or not, I'll, I'll add a, a few caveats at the end. So first and foremost, descriptive statistics. You, you gotta have a good handle on descriptive stats, um, not just for data science, machine learning and AI, but you need to just kind of understand how to look at a visual and, and get information from that visual. You know, if I look at a histogram, um, 
I need to be able to, to describe what's actually happening in this histogram. What information, what, what is the data representing in, in this visual? And the best way to do that is to understand descriptive statistics. Tons of free courses online um, to, to get you into descriptive stats. It's very easy to, to learn on the fly. It doesn't take much time at all. Um, inferential statistics would be next, but I wouldn't say that that's what you really need right now. It can be helpful, but if you feel comfortable with descriptive statistics, your next priority is some type of spreadsheeting um, tool. So if you have a Google account, you can use Google Sheets for free. Um, it's probably um, one of the most ubiquitous spreadsheet tools out there. Excel, of course, is as well. Most businesses use Excel, um, but it, it, it costs money if you're a self learner. So I would definitely say um, Google Sheets or some other kind of free spreadsheeting tool is the first thing that you should get comfortable with. Understanding tabular data, how it's represented, is really going to take you to the next level. And then beyond that, it would be um, SQL or, or SQL. Um, and that basically is just a language. It would be your first programming language if you don't come from a programming background. Um, but it's a language that's going to help you pull very specific information from a bunch of different um, tables or um, spreadsheets, if you will. Because a lot of times the data you want isn't exactly in the format or the table that you want it to be in. You got to take something from over here, take something from over there and, and put it together um, so that you can actually get the information that you're looking for. So those those would be the, the big three. Thanks so much for sharing, Amber. So Annie, another one for you. Um, do you need a degree to be a data storyteller? Okay, so this is a great question and there are different answers to it because do you need a degree to be a great storyteller or a data storyteller? No, you don't need a degree. However, um, a bachelor's degree is recommended. However, certificate programs and MOOCs, uh, a history in the specific field of studies if you're a data storyteller and you're in the education field. Um, maybe if you've been working in technology in higher education, you're a UX designer in education, you decide to step over into storytelling because you have that vertical expertise. For instance, there are a lot of ways that you can either have a bachelor's degree in traditional academic setting going into the workplace, or you can have vertical expertise and you want to go ahead and adapt that vertical expertise to this use. I think it's less about the degree and more about the experience, but a degree will help kind of give you a baseline. I just think there's a huge gap right now. There's a talent gap in data science and it. So I think if, if you don't have a degree, but you're able to learn some of these skills and you're able to really adapt for data storytelling specifically, learning Tableau, getting really solid, getting some of those public data sets, getting a great list of projects you've done and insights you've gleaned, I think that'll position you well, even if you don't have a, a bachelor's. Thanks so much, Annie. Um, Amber, another one for you. Um, without any job experience, how do I showcase my skills to employers? Okay, great, awesome, awesome question, Emma. Thank you. Um, so, without any experience, you know, how are how are you actually going to get the attention of employers, right? So, this can be done in a couple of ways. Um, the first thing that I would start doing is start is begin to create an online presence. Um, blogging is the easiest way um, to start creating an online presence. Um, so, you know, go ahead, find yourself a, a free blogging site. There's tons of them out there, probably something in, in the data space um, and, and create an account. Um, if you're nervous to do that, that's okay. You can write under a pseudonym and, uh, initially, just get out there and start writing about what you're doing. How did, you know, who are you? How did you get into data science? Why are you interested in data science? What are you learning about? What types of questions do you have about what you're learning? Just, just get out there and start putting your thoughts um, on proverbial paper, paper, if you will. Just get them out there. Start interacting with the community. They're, if you have a question about something that you're learning or if you learned something and you want to teach others, I guarantee you it's a perfect way to connect with, with other people um, who are probably in a similar position as you and are also looking to connect um, and network. Recruiters um, and companies, they look at this kind of stuff all the time. I have a ton of previous students who have literally gotten job offers from blogs that they've written. Um, so get out there and start interacting. 
Um, the next thing that you can do is to actually showcase the things that you might be working on um, in a course that you're taking. So um, if you're working on, on the data science course in skillsforall.com, uh, we do walk you through um, how to create a GitHub account, um, which is you know, uh, an online platform where software engineers and data scientists um, basically like push their work. Um, so they kind of, it's a place to post their, their code or their SQL queries or their projects that they're working on um, on a pub free and public space. Um, for kind of the world to see and interact with and maybe even learn from. Um, but our course actually helps you get started uh, doing this. So you can head over there and do that. We're also going to be releasing a course early next year um, that's going to expand um, on how you create that online presence through blogging and through um, pushing your, your projects to, um, to a place like GitHub. Um, and then also you, you can learn Excel and SQL in that course as well. Um, so, you know, just get started, get out there, take some free stuff and whatever you're learning about, start writing about it um, and whatever projects you're doing, um, start getting them out there on some public platform. You can even blog about the projects that you're doing if you're not comfortable getting into something a little bit more technical, like, like GitHub right away. Just get out there and start networking, start connecting with other people who are on a similar journey um, and and you'll get noticed, trust me. Thanks so much, uh, Amber. And I have another one for you, Amber, that's just come in and it's uh, another member of our audience today wanting to know if I'm in my 30s, 40s or 50s, uh, do you think that will hinder my transition into the data space? Love this question, such a great question. So glad um, that you asked this. So absolutely not. Uh, your age will not hinder um, you getting into this space whatsoever. Um, first and foremost, I was in my 30s when I got into uh, the data science space, and I don't think that it hurt me at all. Um, also, I have tons of previous students, colleagues um, that I've worked with in the tech space who transitioned into tech um, in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, um, and in fact, it, it almost helped them get into this space. In fact, it did help them get into this space. So um, most of the time, employers are looking for soft skills. They're not really looking for tech skills. Like some, depending on the type of role that you're trying to get, there may be um, a certain level of, uh, of skill that you need to have to, like a barrier of entry, if you will, to get into that role. Um, but most of the time, it's your soft skills that people are hiring for. Um, a lot of younger people struggle with this type of stuff. Older people have had decades and, and multiple years of experience working in whatever industry that they came from, developing good communication skills, good collaboration skills, um, how to work on a team, um, empathy, developing um, you know real empathy for for. Um, for others and the people that they work with and their customers. So this stuff is very hard to learn. The tech skills, depending on the skill, of course, it can be hard to learn. But from my experience, working with companies, getting students jobs um, and being a manager and, and hiring myself in, in this space, I can tell you right now, you, you being an older candidate only as a pro, um, it's never a con. Um, and, and you should not let your age stand in your way. And the last question is for you, Annie. If I wanted to explore data storytelling, where can I get the data I can use to learn? The example I shared where Emily was able to actually go into her company, it actually took her a while. It's not necessarily an easy thing. And so when you're looking to use live data in your company or not, maybe not live, but maybe an Excel spreadsheet with lots of columns and lots of rows of data that you can use to play around with with Tableau, or if you're learning Python or another language that can help you um, to practice data science. Uh, start to look at the systems that capture data. Start to ask questions to figure out who has ownership over those systems. Um, try to find an analytics team in your company. Um, or you can go to, if you just want general data to play with, you can go to data.world. 
there are data sets that you can use that are public data sets like election information or sometimes it's weather information from NOAA. And what you can do is you can start to use some of that data to do visualizations just to get practice. So those are the kind of the two pathways. Figure out who is in charge of analytics in your organization or in your company. And then the other side of it would be going and looking at public data sets. That's all we have time for today. Um, if you'd like to explore more on data science, start with our free online intro to data science course. Details on how to access our data science course is displayed on the screen. And be sure to tune into part two of our da data science where we will have Annie back so we can all geek out on more data driven narratives. Today's presentation and recordings will be made available after the session. The link to our website has been placed in the chat window. As a reminder, by being part of our live audience today does entitle you to free course enrollment. Details are visible on the screen and we have placed the link in the chat window. Your feedback is important to us. Please complete the survey and you will receive a certificate of participation. You can scan the QR code that you can see on the screen. Uh, we do look forward to you joining our next Women Rock IT event where we'll meet more amazing role models who innovate like technologists, think like entrepreneurs and act as social change agents. For details, please visit our Women Rock IT website. Thanks for joining us today and we'll see you next time. Enjoy the rest of your day. Running makes me feel happy. My favorite part about cross country is like the mental part. I'm Max. When I was 11 years old, I was diagnosed with aplastic anemia. And if I didn't find a donor, I probably wouldn't be here right now.